yes as i was talking in the previous video of another ground on which we see how we feel not depressed but relieved while watching the suffering and defeat in the tragic representations as we were talking of this line aristotle in the first place sets out to account for the undeniable though remarkable that many tragic representations of suffering and defeat leave an audience feeling not depressed but relieved or even exalted the other ground is that when we see those tragedies on the stage somehow if we connect ourselves to those tragic scenes as we suffer in our life sometimes such questions come before us why am i suffering what have i done why is this happened always with me only you know when you watch those tragedies you clearly understand that no this only doesn't happen with you this happens with others also it doesn't mean that others pain gives us pleasure it means it gives a kind of satisfaction that no it's not just us who suffer there are other people as well even if being good they suffer on that ground also one gets relieved by seeing suffering and defeat as we know very uh, clearly that the stories stories of failure stories of failure much inspire us than the stories of success why do they inspire us because that is the reality and that happens us with most of the times so we feel much more connected with those stories of failure okay so i hope now you understand the other ground on which we see that many a times we see that tragic representations of suffering and defeat how do they relieve us sometimes okay so this was the first point on which the commentators were unanimous they agreed in the second place aristotle uses this distinctive effect on the reader which he calls the pleasure of pity and fear see here it's very much clear 
he says how it affects the audience it creates a kind of pity and fear both at the same time and what does he say the pleasure of pity and fear so it's very uh, interesting to know that how can one be pleased while having pity and fear see human nature is very complex we take pleasure in negative emotions as well and that's why we watch horror movies we get frightened while watching horror movies even then we like watching horror movies and many a times by creating the same atmosphere in a house as well as it is suggested that if you have to watch a horror movie you must put your lights off so that you can really enjoy it so we have that you know characteristics that nature of appreciating so called negative emotions as well actually those all are emotions it's all upon us we call them negative or positive so he says that how this distinctive effect creates the pleasure of pity and fear so why do have pity for the people who suffer for the tragic hero we have pity because we see how they were not that much bad as they are being suffered means a kind of you know the concept that we have the concept of poetic justice as we know poetic justice is how vice and virtues are punished or rewarded in their proportion so we see how a person who is not as that much bad as he is you know suffering so we have pity towards them and think no this should not be done this should not be with this person he does not deserve it and fear why the fear the fear of being connected with the same fortune or the downfall if this happens if this is happening with this person who is that much good what if this happens with us that kind of fear and even in this fear and pity we have a pleasure at sometimes pain also gives birth to the pleasure as the most suitable example that i find in nature when a mother gives birth to a child after a huge pain when she sees her child all her pain goes away and happiness or pleasure takes it its existence or place okay so in the second place aristotle uses this distinctive effect on the reader which he calls the pleasure of pity and fear 
so this effect he is talking about the pleasure of pity and fear as the basic way to distinguish the tragic from the comic see this is the difference or other forms so how tragedy is different from comedy or other forms in tragedy we have the pleasure of pity and fear obviously we don't have pity and fear in comedy or in other forms as it is told by aristotle and he regards the dramatists aim to produce this effect in the highest degree and that's why he says that it's the responsibility of a dramatist to produce this effect in the highest degree as the principle that determines the choice and moral qualities of the tragic protagonist and the organization of the tragic plot so how should he do that it should be as a principle that determines the choice and moral qualities of the tragic protagonist choice and moral qualities of the tragic protagonist and the organization of the tragic plot so it means he talks how the tragic plot should be needed in that manner so that this effect must be created in the highest degree and that should be the principle of writing tragedy okay see when it comes to plot we must know that how he says plot as the soul of tragedy he gives more importance to the plot unlike shakespeare who gives more importance to the character in comparison to the plot this is the basic difference between aristotelian concept and shakespearean concept and in the aristotelian concept we have plot as being supreme plot is in the center in shakespearean concept we have character in the center character is in the supreme position okay so why talking of tragedy in chapter 6 he gives the definition of tragedy and while giving definition he uses these two terms mimesis and catharsis mimesis means imitation catharsis means purgation or purification so these are two terms other two terms that he talks of that through them this catharsis can take place and those two terms are peripety and anagnorsis what is peripety p e r i p e t y peripety peripety means reversal of situation and anagnorsis means recognition say for example whenever we talk of aristotelian concept we always have to take the examples from classical tragedies from the greek tragedies those were written before aristotle so we have a famous greek tragedy oedipus rex o e o e d i p u s r e x or in english translation we have oedipus the king in oedipus rex we have oedipus as the protagonist there we find the depiction of famine 
and the king wants to know the reason behind this why the nature has become that much cruel has somebody committed sin so he wants to find out the person who is the sinner so as a king he is in a dominating position and he is a person who can give punishment this is the condition but ultimately when it is found that the sinner is none other than oedipus himself who has committed a sin by marrying his own mother and by producing some children out of that marriage when he gets acquainted with that heinous sin A reversal of situation takes place so what does take place peripety p e r i p e t y peripety takes place and since he recognizes his own sin so anagnorsis takes place and from there we see how the situation is reversed he has become a sinner he is a person who has to get punishment so he has to give punishment to himself and he does the same by losing his two eyes both the eyes he did that by making others bring two hot iron rods ultimately he punished himself so and from there we see how the tragedy of oedipus takes place how he falls from the throne how he falls from the higher strata higher status of a king as a sinner his downfall okay so catharsis and by you know seeing that this catharsis is created in the audience so this peripety and anagnorsis helps in bringing pity and fear ultimately leading to the catharsis and yes this particular term can be well understood in the light of rasa theory as given by sage bharat in india and interestingly enough here also we have the rasa theory in chapter 6 so the concept of tragedy is in chapter 6 of poetics here the concept of rasa theory is also in the chapter 6 of natya shastra the great treatise written by bharat So what is the rasa theory let me tell you in in a brief as it is said by bharat that and see uh, in bharat also we have the actor in the center not the plot okay abhineta so as he says that while reading the plot 
as it is read by actor first for acting the same on the stage so while reading that while knowing while co comprehending the story of the plot a rush is created in the heart of the actor and he has to improvise that rasa he has to transfer the same rasa in the audience through his acting so actor is there on the stage for creation of the rasa in the heart of the sahridaya sahridaya that is the quality of the audience as is told by says bharat sahridaya means the person of having great heart here he talks how a person must be you know a lover of arts that person should be sahridaya there he says how audience are also needed to be you know well understood of the arts like drama and others so the the rasa the kind of emotion that the actor has while knowing the plot or the story the same rasa should be transmitted should be transferred among the audience so a kind of feeling of catharsis the emotion okay and yes uh while giving the definition of tragedy he also talks of i mean aristotle also talks of six components of tragedy there you should remember those greek terms with english translations the first one is mythos mythos m y t h o s that is for plot and then ethos ethos e t h o s that is for character then we have third one that's called dianoia d i a n o i a dia noia that is for thought and then fourth one is lexis l e x i s and that is for diction d i c t i o n diction the fifth one is melos m e l o s that is for music somewhere you will find song as the translation so melos stands for music or song the sixth one is opsis o p s i s that stands for spectacle or setting so mythos ethos dianoia lexis melos opsis are the six elements the constitutive elements of tragedy as told by aristotle so this is how you are now acquainted with 10 greek terms today six elements mythos ethos dianoia lexis melos opsis two others are peripety and anagnosis for reversal of situation and recognition and the other two are mimesis and catharsis imitation and purgation okay it's all for today thank you